everybody, Josh Sheridan there with the Barely Legal Podcast. They demand my alter ego, but I won't go. Because I'm On today's show, we have Dr. Joe Saddley, or Dr. Joe as I like to call him. Uh, I have had the benefit of working with Dr. Satterly for pretty much the duration of my career in various aspects, both in uh, the criminal court as well as the family law court. He has quite an interesting story. He's been involved in many interesting cases, some with me and some with other people that I've heard about. Uh, he's always made himself available to me to uh, discuss uh, all things psychological and or psychiatric, whether my personal or or professional uh, inquiries. So thank you for coming by the show today. You're really welcome. It's good to be here. It's been a while. Now, are you still an Ebor resident? I'm or? living in Ebor. Okay. Yes, Do you still have the chickens? I still have the chickens and uh, some ducks. That's awesome. So uh, having having a wildlife in Ebor has always been an interesting juxtaposition for always, me. It's always part of it. You, there's two things in Ebor. You have chickens and roosters and you have all kinds of sterile, I mean, uh, feral cats. Wow. Those uh, two things go together uh, not, not too well. Not too well, but yeah. That's Ebor. So do you have a, uh, what do you call it, a uh, coop? I have a coop for the ducks and a coop for the chickens. And then they, I have, I have a house that backs up to the next house. So I have two yards that are all fenced in. And oh, they, that works out. They run free all day long and uh, really healthy and organic eggs. Now, does that require much work on your part or are they pretty much? They're do- easy to tend to. You I mean, you got to give them fresh food and water and you got to keep their coop clean. Other right. than that, you just let them roam. They're healthy animals, and hopefully they lay their eggs in the coop at night. Well, there you go. Now, uh, I have, at various points in my career, spent a lot of time with you. Uh, so I kind of have an ebb and a flow as to how well acquainted I am with what's going on in your life. Okay. Um, now, if I recall, you've got, do you have a son and a daughter? I have a son and a daughter. And some of them live up in Central Florida. I don't remember. Both, both of them live in Orlando, okay. about a mile from each other. Okay. And uh, we talked a little bit about this, but for those of the, those of uh, our listeners who who don't know you, where are you from originally? I'm originally from New Hampshire and Maine. Okay. Uh, moved to Florida during my adolescence and got sand in my shoes, went back to Maine, and then came back to Florida for college, uh, graduated and got married the same afternoon, then went back to Maine. Oh, wow. And I've been back in Florida since 1987, I think. Now, if I recall, I, I, I believe you have at least one brother. I have three brothers and I had a sister. Okay. And I've seen pictures of at least one of the brothers and you guys look a lot alike. Oh, uh, we all do. Yeah. No twins, but you all just kind of have. You can look at all my cousins and my uncles and aunts. We all look alike. What is Satterley? What what derivation it's, is that? It is it is Northern European or Eastern European. It's, it's mostly from the UK. Okay. All right. Uh, so uh, – Growing up in Maine, was your family a family of faith, or were they agnostic, atheist? No, we grew, we, we grew up at Methodist. Yeah. Um, what did your parents do? My father was an entrepreneur and ran different businesses, everything from lumber and box factory, and then he went into gasoline and oil and air conditioning, and uh, we had we had ships that delivered product off the islands of the coast of Maine, and houses that we. Fuel oil, and we owned thirty-five convenience stores. Oh wow! Oh, oh, it was it was a big operation. We had three hundred and fifty employees. Holy cow! I had no idea. What about your mom? Did she work? My the- mom worked side by side with him and kept the books and kept him straight. Are they around anymore? Or? No, they both passed away ooh, about eight years ago. Okay. Within, within three weeks of each other. Really? Yeah. Who went first? Uh, my father went first. And the story is my mother went three weeks later because he was waiting at the pearly gates and needed a recommendation to get in. So uh, I lost both my parents within a year of each other, but their marriage at the end there, I mean, they loved each other dearly, but they were fighting like cats and dogs. So, you know, I, I feel like it can go one of two ways. Either you're freed of the encumbrance of your spouse and kind of have a weight lifted off you or you get a well there's actually a phrase for it isn't it like a heart there's like a don't they call it something where one spouse goes after the other one there's almost like a physical oh, there's a, a, well there's what they call the broken heart syndrome broken heart syndrome and is what i'm and, looking for and that's actually uh it's real part of the heart slows down and ultimately 
they just die. It's the broken heart syndrome. It's um, There's a funny name for it that I can't give you the medical term. My parents were a little different at the end. My father had cared for my mother for 16 years. She had Parkinson's. Oh, okay. and, uh, he suffered a stroke and had to go into a nursing home. Oh, man. And so she was at home being cared for for about another year. And then she gets to the point where she needs skilled nursing care. <clears throat> so they went to the same nursing home, but my mother refused to share a room with my father. In fact, absolutely refused to be, even be on the same floor. He was on the fourth really? floor. And she was on the second floor, partly for safety issues. He had his stroke and my brothers were concerned that he'd try and holler out of bed and maybe yeah. go for a walk or something yeah. like that. But um, yeah, so it was, it was a real different ending for their marriage. Very tough. You know, I, I've always talked about how it's not always this way, but oftentimes with children and parents, the roles kind of reverse there at the end where you're having to monitor their behavior and kind of do all the things that they did for you in the beginning years of your life. Yep. It's 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 Maslow's hierarchy reversed. Yeah. You know, they go from being fine, then they lose some competence, then they start crawling around. And yeah, it's just a complete just reversal the of reverse, the birth process. Right, right. So um, are you the first doctor in the family? I'm the first. Well, I have two brothers that went to law school, so they actually have Juris Doctorates, but I'm the first one that's that's in the health As field. much as I like to claim that a Juris Doctorate <laughs> is a doctorate, I don't think anybody's going to buy that. Uh, yeah, um, so I'm, I'm the first I'm the first uh, health professional in the family. Now, uh, how did that what was the what was the kind of evolution there? Because one of the one of the things that they always say and I, you and I know each other know each other well enough to know that I say this tongue in cheek, but they usually say people that go into mental health are crazy for yes. some reason. Yes. And it's almost a way of self self treating or self medicating. Nobody goes into the field of psychology who is quote unquote normal. Okay. We're attracted to this business because something has occurred with us that we're trying to figure out how we feel the way that we do or think the way that we do. Uh, the problem is, is that most mental health professionals go to grad school and they start working with people who they see as worse off than them. Right. So they never go into therapy and, and ultimately they never figure it out. They, they just feel figure, okay. Cause they're not as bad as everybody else. Correct. But the problem with that is, is if you don't know yourself, you're in your, you're in your client's way. Well, isn't there, isn't there some practice? I don't know if it's required by the boards or if it's just kind of how it works where the therapists will treat with each other on the side. Yeah. Some, some uh, graduate schools actually require that students go through two years of therapy. They don't, they don't want to know what their therapizing is, but they have to produce two years worth of receipts sure. for physical, for, for mental health counseling. It's not a bad idea. Um, so what was, and you can say as much or as little as you want about it, but what is it that kind of planted the seed for you to want to go? Um, I had a tough adolescence. Um, I, I, all of my brothers and siblings had gone off to school while I was still at home as a 10 year old. Sure. Uh, ultimately the education system in Maine wasn't terrific. I was sent off to boarding school at 14. Uh, I was neither old enough nor mature enough to go. Um, and that, you know, I had a lot of depression through my life at that point. Um, Is this the seventies or what, what this would have been? Yeah. The, the mid seventies. Okay. And, um, so I graduated from, from boarding school, took a year off and then decided I certainly didn't want to work with my hands for a living and decided to go to college. And psychology seemed like a real natural thing to study. It, it, it really, uh, it was kind of when it was really starting to take off because before that period of time, there wasn't it, a lot of stock on a, on, on a, on a, on a social level, you know, given to it. Yeah. It was still an opening field. You yeah. Know, this, the early sixties was the beginning of psychology. Psychiatry had existed before that. Um, but I was just real interested in studying it. I did really well, but uh, I thought I'd go to graduate school. Where'd you go to college? I went to college at Stetson University. In Deland. In Deland. Okay, great. Uh, I got a great education there. Um, and I knew that I didn't have enough foundation in things like neurobiology or anything like that to apply to graduate schools at the time. So I graduated, got married the same afternoon and took my wife to Maine in the snow. And she'd never seen it before. She's a native Floridian. And we lasted for four years and then reapplied to grad schools and went back to Stetson and got master's degrees. Wow. You got it all knocked out that quickly. Yes. Now, is is your wife of Latino descent? No, she's Sicilian. Like Sicilian. Your wife. Okay. Yeah. yeah that's half right. Sicilian and half German. That's right. Okay. Well, <laughs> <laughs> so don't piss our wives off. No. Um, so then you went back to grad school and what, what was your focus or what was your, well, my, uh, my master's degree was in school guidance and counseling. Okay. Um, it was just an easy way to get to a PhD program. Sure. Uh, we did our master's degrees in a year and a half, which is kind of unheard of. 
Uh, we then went to Florida State. Uh, I got my PhD there in counseling psychology and human services. My wife was working on her doctorate in education and got pregnant partway through. Oh, wow. So the, the agreement was I'd finish and then someday she'd go back to grad school. And when she turned 50, she went back to grad school at USF and got her PhD in education. Full circle. Yes, sir. So, uh, well, I, I still want to keep going through your history, but at some point I want to kind of talk to you about the two arenas that I occupy, the criminal criminal uh, defense aspect and yep. then obviously the family law, which I know you've kind of found your way at. Oh, yeah. Uh, into as an expert as well. So uh, once you got your degree, what was your first? Did you go right on to private practice or did you work? Well, as soon as, as soon as I got well, I, I, I moved to this area to Safety Harbor to finish out uh, an internship. We have to do a full year's internship. Um, I'd started one in Tallahassee, but it got interrupted. So I came down here to finish. Um, and, and I, you know, I was interested. I started teaching at St. Pete College. And then one day, um, I went and took guardian ad litem training. Cause okay. it, cause it interested me. I have two brothers that are attorneys and they're both married to attorneys. Do so they do family law? No. Okay. But that's the only reason I didn't go to law school. Okay. Uh, so I was interested in the law. I took the guardian ad litem training and then I went, uh, my first case was very interesting and I went and interviewed, um, the psychologist who'd been involved in that case and he was a child custody evaluator. And I said, Hey, I can do what you do. And the money's a whole lot better, better than, than what I'm I doing. Do, yeah. And so I, I started learning about that. I went and took mediation training. I took a bunch of training in child custody. And then I kind of put my shingle out and uh, an attorney in Tampa met me at the mediation training. And I got my first case two days later. Once you get your foot in that door, you it's know, good. Yes. well, it's good. And, you know, it's the same five names you hear constantly. Yeah. And, and I that, was doing, I was, but I was between Pasco, Pinellas and Tampa. Yeah, no, um, it's true. Cause you kind of occupy both sides of the bridge. Yep. Um, now, did you work in the jails at all or did Never. you do it? No. Uh, now, I've done, I have done some criminal work. Probably just all the ones that I've brought. You probably. Away. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. And I've gotten involved with a couple of the referrals. It's, it's not my area of, of, Usually there's not a lot of money in it. Sure. And two, you know, there's the old phrase that criminals in court are on their best behavior and they're bad people. Right. But family law is really good people on their worst behavior. Sure. So. Well, um, so with the family law, how long did you do that as a primary uh, evaluator? Because at some point you kind of transitioned to more peer review, didn't you? Yeah, I did. I did custody evaluations for about mm, 18 years. And you did uh, some pretty big oh i cases. did some big ones yes and and ones that even that dragged on for long times and got lots of publicity and that stuff um and then they just the, the field of custody has gotten to be phenomenally uh, more complicated sure and and the money that you really need to charge for a thorough investigation very few people have uh, very few people have and and in my opinion, it just the the amount of money it costs for what you really got for it and the court benefit, I I couldn't justify it in my own mind anymore. And so what I went to do is peer reviews, forensic reviews of other people's reports. So basically, just for those people who are listening who don't know what we're talking about, if you're in the middle of a divorce case and uh, an expert's brought on, uh, there's two different ways. Well, there's a multitude of ways, but generally the two ways that it happens is is an expert's brought on to do a child custody evaluation, sometimes a guardian ad litem, sometimes uh, someone with your background. And then what you can do if 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 you think there's issues with how that process was done is bring in your own expert to evaluate what the other person did. And this is what you're speaking about. Yes. I mean, I, it's I, I've reviewed some really wonderful reports and I've reviewed some reports that people should be disciplined for because they're so shoddy. Right. Right. Um, so. I've had this conversation with various family law attorneys who've been on this show about the way that the court system treats uh, the timesharing component or the child custody is what we used to call it. We right. call it timesharing time now. now. And then shared parental responsibility. And the consensus with pretty much everybody in the field is that they don't like the system where they vary widely is what the solution to that problem is. Yeah, and I've heard several of the people on your on your podcast talk about that, that we really need some reforms. Yeah. I, you know, I, I had one suggestion was is that maybe that part of it isn't handled by the courts. It's more can't handled in a holistic fashion. Uh, Mark Baseman had an interesting proposition where basically there's a one year grace period after a divorce for people to kind of operate with a 50 50 and see 
how that works. And maybe after a year when they're not so, you know, when the when the, when the real when the uh, knives passion, are, has yeah, when the passion has kind of been let out of the room to see if maybe they'll be more inclined to work with each other then. Uh, you know, one of the things that I know has always been very big, especially in some of the cases that we've had together, is this this phrase parental alienation. Yes. And there almost seemed to be a whole cottage industry net then built on yeah. parental alienation. And one of the things that I see is a phrase or a concept becomes popular and then it's just used everywhere. Uh, one that I hear all the time as an attorney either from other attorneys, from clients, whatever, is the concept of a narcissist. Yes. Everybody's a narcissist. Everybody's a narcissist. Now, through my own therapy, I've learned that there's a spectrum of narcissism, and we all probably fall on it somewhere. Well, anybody who has a decent ego and a decent self-concept has some narcissistic qualities about them. That's, sure. That's, it's, there's healthy narcissism. Right. So it's it's the extremes where it becomes problematic. Would Correct. That be a fair when, assessment? when you start to think that you're bigger than you really are and that you're either more powerful or you know more than everybody else does and your way should be the way, that's, that's when we're getting off into the real extremes of narcissism. Now, what's the accepted thinking? Is that something that is a person is groomed to have through their experiences in life? Is it just a genetic thing? Is it a chemical thing? Is I mean, it- it's, it's partly, it's partly upbringing. I don't know that there's much genetics to it. I mean, either you've been successful at the things that you have done and you've made, you know, significant accomplishments that gives you reason to feel good about yourself. And that's, narcissistic traits, but it's when you have a false sense of identity and your exterior is very fragile and you really haven't accomplished the things that you brag about. That's when we refer to you as being very narcissistic Narcissistic, and sometimes you're even, uh, we have toxic or uh, malignant uh, narcissists. Narcissism. So uh, going back to parental alienation, you're familiar with that concept. Quite. And, and uh, is that something you can speak on in a general sense? Is that something that you feel is the the epidemic that it's portrayed to be? Is it something that exists? Is it? I think it's uh, uh, it, it exists. Okay, even I mean, parental alienation exists in every single divorce because as soon as in every single marriage, probably in every, in every single marriage. <laughs> I mean, it's just you know that 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 sharp non uh, non okay statement that you said about mom because you know she parked a car in the wrong place. Okay? Yeah, those are alienating things that we say that the children pick up on. Sure, there are cases where parents go to the extreme to try to turn their children against the other parent. And that's the extreme parental alienation we were talking about. Right. Um, So with your experience in family law, uh, there's a, there's another concept and I was, I forget who it was that I was talking about this with. I think it was a Steve Gavitorta who was on a couple weeks ago, uh, just the concept of emotional intelligence. And, And I understand those two words independently of each other. And in the context of each other, I can kind of, grasp what that is, but only in the past couple years, ironically, the past four years since 2016 has the import of emotional intelligence reared its uh, its head for me, yeah. both in my own life, politically speaking and everything else. And uh, what I see is I run into people who are extremely accomplished in their life, whether it's professionally, athletically, Whatever the case may be, but I either I don't know if it's society's fault, if it's just that there's not an emphasis put on it, but it seems to me that emotionally people stop maturing very early on and never take any steps to to evolve in that fashion. Yeah. I mean, people get stuck at a particular place of development. Something happens and then they kind of stop. Would you would you agree with me that that's a large contributor to why people find themselves in the family law court? A lack of emotional intelligence? Sure. Yeah. I mean, emotional intelligence is the ability to read somebody else and then to adapt your own behavior to essentially guide that person to where you want them. Right. Now, some people do it 
in an exploitive kind of way. And they do it very consciously. Right. Other people have just kind of been gifted with good emotional intelligence and they read the person and they counteract what they see. And they're just on top of that. And it just comes as a very gifted part of their nature. And it kind of goes hand in hand with the ability to communicate with your spouse, your coworkers, if you opposing have, counsel, judges, clients. Yep. If you have emotional intelligence, you are guaranteed to be, guaranteed to be a good communicator. And probably Both more it. empathetic, would you agree? Oh, absolutely. Or? Because okay. you're, you're minutely watching the facial reactions of the person that you're speaking with. And you're just taking all that data in and you're adjusting your tone and your inflection and everything else to essentially kind of manipulate that person. You're not really manipulating because you're not doing it necessarily consciously, but you're adjusting to them to make sure that your message is being received the way you want to send it. Well, again, just like, just like there's a spectrum of narcissism, a spectrum of parental alienation. I think there's a spectrum of manipulation. And as you suggest, just existing, you're manipulating. I mean, I'm manipulating the chair that I'm sitting in. Yeah. I directed you to the room that we're interviewing this in. Right, that's I complimented you on you know, losing, you know, all of it is manipulation in some way, shape or form. So obviously there's acceptable manipulation and then unacceptable. Right, and, then, and then you can become exploitive. Well, if you really become keen on what you're doing and are using it to some other end, then obviously yes. uh, getting back to politics. Yeah, yeah. I, I would I would say I would dare say that during a deposition, there are many attorneys who have emotional intelligence and deliberately push buttons and exploit emotional situations sure. to to charge up a deposition. Sure. Same as on the stand. Sure. So uh you, it's a part aside from emotional intelligence and people cavalierly throwing around the word narcissism and parental alienation, was there any other aspects of family law that you saw? I know you wrote uh, at least one book, if not several yeah, books. I, I wrote a, sat, a satirical book called How to Lose a Custody Battle. Right. And uh, it was it was good. It was a really good business call card. Uh, a few and people, this was before the whole ebook. Oh, yeah. I mean, this was when you had to call up a printer and print them out and bind them and do yeah, everything else. Yeah. So I printed a bunch of them, sent them around attorneys. I had a few people buy them. Uh, the funny thing was one. one guy uh, bought it online and then returned it and said, I, I, I didn't understand the book. And I had to I had to wonder if satire was something he didn't understand and whether that contributed to his divorce. Oh, well, yeah. Uh, User so, error. Yeah. Um, so after 18 years, you had kind of backed out. It was that was that because of being tired with the area or other reasons outside of? Well, when you're doing custody evaluations and custody reports, there's always something to do. You know, yeah. there's always testing to be done or documentation to be read. And, and it just, they last forever. Very stressful. And, and you know, you can go to bed, but there's never anything done. Sure. When I'm just reviewing somebody else's report and the materials, it's a finite end. You know, I just make sure that the paperwork matches up with what they've written, make sure that everything's there, you know, make sure that they've done the proper steps. I can sleep better at night. Uh, the money's just as good, if not better. Right. Uh, and and it, it helps to correct situations that bad reports create. Uh, and what are some common missteps or errors in reports when you're reviewing them? Well, I'm, I'm, I've just got a brand new one that I'm reviewing. I haven't even made it all the way through the report. Okay. But, but the evaluator did not contact one single person outside the mother and father and the children. They right. didn't, didn't speak to anybody. No third-party collateral. No third-party collateral. All, didn't do any testing. Simply, and, and the thing was, the thing lasted 15 months, started, and and... You know, there's all kinds of excuses in it or why it took so long. Right. A lot of it is COVID. Well, you know, the data collection ended last January. Oh, yeah, right. COVID didn't COVID. hit here until March. Right. Okay. So all the information's old. It's taken forever to get out. And it's really not, there's no, there's no research in it whatsoever. We've got all kinds of research about custody evaluations and families and children. And, you know, in this case is full of, you know, kind of yucky stuff. Right. And it's just, it's, it's thin. It's, it's of no value to the court because it's so dated and there's no collateral information. It's just this guy interviewed a few people and that's it. Well, here's my opinion. And how does that happen? Lack of experience, just too busy. Uh, this this particular individual has been disciplined before. Okay. Um, particularly about a custody evaluation. Sure. I'm, I'm not sure how the court system has allowed him to continue to do right. these because you just shouldn't. I mean, he does damage to families. Right. Now, uh, there there was kind of that hallowed crop of doctors that we all used and family law for a period of time. I've started to see new names pop up. Have you seen it? Kind of. A what? growing breadth of who's 
well, doing I, a lot I, of these? I belong to a listserv of all the old, you know, all of us that yeah. were, used to do this for years. And there is a significant decrease in the number of people who are interested in child custody work. Well, it's hard to get through this work as an attorney, as an expert, as a judge without making a lot of enemies. Correct. And, you know, everybody's always looking for a way to take you down. Oh, yeah. And every time you do a custody evaluation, you make one enemy. Well, okay. sure. Or, or, or maybe both or, of them, yeah, both or parents. Maybe multiple. Or maybe other think, people. Yeah. So, no, I, I always, I always, uh, I always lament that before I became an attorney, I was generally well liked by everybody I ran into. And then sometimes I find myself in court where, the, you know, opposing parties grit their teeth at me. The opposing attorney is yelling at me. My client's upset because I'm charging them too much money. And the judge is upset at everybody in the room and is like, I don't have a fan in this whole room. Yeah. I, I think I did a pretty good job over the years because in 20 years, I, I'm only aware of, of two attorneys that really um, took a disliking to me. Right. Um, all the others saw me as impartial. They used me a lot. Uh, I think I had great respect of the judges. Uh, and that's hard to do in this field because you have to stay neutral. You have to stay unbiased. You have to, a lot of times, bite your tongue and, and learn to say things properly and when to keep your mouth shut. Now, I've, uh, I've personality-wise, have always gelled very well with you. I feel like you and I kind of always end up in the same conclusion on things. Yep. You and I are able to communicate with each other very well. And, and maybe wrongly, I arrive at the conclusion that you and I are similar. I am scared to death of having your training with the way that my brain works because I would just analyze myself constantly and probably go down a rabbit hole that I'd never get out of. Well, it, Is it's that a, a danger that you... It, it's an occupational hazard. Sure. Uh, the worst thing for me is, is unfortunately, I was cursed with high intelligence and high emotional intelligence. And so whenever I meet somebody, I'm analyzing everything they do. Well, my wife's family, they're all orthodontists, and I can always tell they're looking at my teeth. Right. So I'm like right. covering my mouth. Yeah. So, I mean, and, and, and I read people so quickly um, that I'm, I'm not a terribly social creature. Um, is it too much? It's almost like you're a, a open valve. you got to kind of create a boundary? Well, it, it, that, but I also get to, I, I'm very aware and, and very quickly pick up on people's um, uh, non-great characteristics. Sure. Okay. And once I've seen that, um, you know, it's, you can't unsee it. I, you can't unsee it. And it just, some of it is so unsavory. Sure. You know, on the surface, they look like great people, they're great community people. But once you see their underbelly and you see that it's, that it's uh, kind of dark. Right. I avoid those people. Right. And and how, how how about as far as being a spouse or a father? How does that? Um, my wife is smarter than I am. You know, we've been married thirty seven years. Sure. Um, I wouldn't be alive without her. Um, does she ever tell you stop analyzing me or stop trying? I don't. To yeah. I mean, sometimes. Yeah. But she also comes to me and says, "Look, I'm having this situation with somebody. Can you can you help Uses me find you some as perspective?" As an asset. Yeah. yeah. And well, again, I, I, I see situations, I size them up quickly, you know, I, I have wisdom, which just means collecting data and being able to come up with the most likely outcome. Sure. Uh, my children do the same. I don't analyze them. I did test the crap out of my son when he was a little kid. Did you really? Well, because I was in grad school. It's like, uh, you know, I gave him a, probably gave giving him, haircuts in barber school. Yeah, 75 <laughs> IQ tests and this achievement test yeah. and that test. And uh, I didn't do so much for my daughter. Um, uh, but, you know, I have great relationships with my kids. We talk all the time. Are IQ tests still generally accepted as? as Absolutely. And, and, and uh, so that's your intelligence quotient. Correct. But that's, there's other, there's an, there's an EQ as well with emotional intelligence. Emotion, emotional intelligence. Is there, there's not a way to test that, is there? No, I mean, no real scientific way. Okay. You know, there's some questions you can ask. Okay. I mean, one of the real ways is, is they have these tests where uh, you look at people's eyes that's all you see. You don't see any other facial features. And they give you four options of what this person is feeling. Sure. Okay. And, you know, you look at a bunch of those, you guess, and then at the end you say, okay, of the 30 faces, how many was I correct on? Right. Okay, I've done those. I, I typically get pretty high. A range of 27, 28. Uh, other people get four or five. Has the evolution, uh, well, has there been an evolution since you started practicing uh, in, in theories and understanding of mental health from when you started to present, or is it pretty much... I mean, there's been new theories. There's been new, uh, you know, cognitive behavioral therapy, which really is kind of the zeitgeist these days. Uh, it's old. 
I mean, it's back from the 60s. Albert Ellis was the one who kind of designed the stuff. So there's, you know, there's been some modifying of it, but uh, not a lot has happened in psychology other than treatment for trauma and some of the medical roots. I mean, um, you know, there's in 25 years ago, there was a really great treatment for PTSD that works, um, strictly psychological. Right. Um, you know, we find we make a little bit of progress, then we fall behind. Um, it's it's the field of psychology is kind of stagnant at the current time. Um, well, there's three there's three areas that I feel like there's the appearance of a change, but I, I wanted to ask you on each of them. So one is when I was a child, I was born in 75, you had the bad kids and the good kids, and that was pretty much it. Yep. Then at some point, these kids have ADD or these kids are on the spectrum or these kids are, um, what's the one where you transpose your letters? Uh, uh, yes. Dyslexic. Dyslexic. Yep. So now, and I'm not saying one's right or one's wrong, but very rarely now is there bad kids and good kids. It's this kid's dealing with this issue. This kid's dealing with this issue. That kid's dealing with that issue. Yeah. I mean, the, the only real thing that we look at now is, is there are sociopathic children okay. who have no consciences. That's, we pretty much think that's a product of genetics. It's also a product of upbringing, but those are the real, you know, those are the real bad seeds. There's not a lot you can do. Um, but you know, now the kids who have ADHD, if you properly medicate them, they're great. Um, we do, you know, autism is a much newer expanding, uh, type of spectrum. Right. You know, we used to just have autistic children and then we had Asperger's. Well, now that we've made it a spectrum disorder, you know, we find that there are a lot of autistic adults who are very successful, Sure, but they some, some run Facebook, I yeah, think. Yeah. yeah. I mean, you know, there's, there's some attorneys, <laughs> yeah. there's some psychologists, sure, there's yeah. a lot of professionals. I yeah. mean, Bill Gates yeah. has autism. Yeah. Uh, they call him, they refer to him as Asperger's, but it, you, you know, I mean, the guy's brilliant. Right. Um, so, but that, 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 so yeah, the good and the bad, uh, there are some bad people. The rest of them, we don't consider bad anymore. Just kind of bad behaviors that we try to correct. So then another one is, uh, for the, and maybe you can correct me on the phraseology, but sexual deviance. Yes. Um, you know, back in the day, you heard rumors about things, but it never really came to light. But now with the Catholic church and now with school teachers, with their students and, it's it's ubiquitous in the news. Is this something that is just more reported, more discovered? Is there a sexual abuse has always been around? Okay. Okay. Is is there more of it now? There seems to be more of an uptick in trafficking and and you know those bigger kinds of operations. Sure. As far as the family stuff and the child abuse that goes on at home. I think more people are getting caught now. Yeah. Okay. COVID has kind of reversed that because we don't have any abuse reports coming in. No one's coming to school. No one's talking no to teachers. No one's talking to the pediatricians counselors. or the emergency rooms. But but as an overall, um, I, I've never seen any evidence that the, that the incidence of child abuse is rising other than we just have identified it more. We've, we've you know, it was 1980 before the word child abuse ever came into professional literature. Right. You know, I went to school with kids that came to school with black and blues and strap marks and it was just nobody, nobody did much about that. Well, another thing about it that is very difficult to talk about because it's such a taboo area, but the way that the criminal justice system teaches this section, because it's worse than murder, you know, in, in, in the public's perception of it, I could say, you know, I, I, you know, I killed someone and people would be appalled. I had, you know, I molested a child molested and they'd be like, oh, and, you know, how come the, you're the, unredeemable and should be well, shot. And, well, right. And so, you know, it's not a, you know, you're not going to see a lot of pop politicians running on the pulpit of, we need to reform, no. you know, how we prosecute these cases. But I feel like until it's understood better and actually addressed more appropriately. Well, it's, 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 it's such a, it, a, it's such a passionate field. Sure. I mean, it, it just, people just explode about Our it. eyes just roll back. Uh, but we have, we have such different vantage points. I mean, if I use the word sexual addiction, you kind of get an impression. Right. I reviewed a report the other day that the psychologist, I mean, there's all kinds, the guy's been treated for sexual addiction. But her perspective is because in the diagnostic manual, there is no, there is no diagnostic term sexual addiction. So she just, Left it out. Poo pooed it. Yeah. I mean, she addressed it, but she said, I'm not going to pay any attention to this because it's not a truly diagnostic category. Right. Okay. You can't do that. You, you know, it, every, every abuse case is different. 
it needs to be analyzed by somebody who has good professional training to do that. Uh, you know, I got trained by the FDLE when I was in, in as, as a guardian ad litem. I still don't like doing it. Right. You have to be careful about questions you ask. You leave. I mean, it's just it's a it's a hard field. Sure. But there is treatment for some people. There is no hope for others. Yeah. Um, you know, it's 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 a very and and when you come to child abuse cases, you get you get parents who make false allegations of sexual abuse and you've opened up a horrible can of worms. Well, and, and so uh, there was a situation uh, when Kobe Bryant passed. Um, I, I, do you remember yep. that? So it was weird because there was a, there was a, a timeline that was very condensed over a period of a few hours for the first hour and a half after he passed, everybody was very, you know, respectful and, oh, that's horrible. So sorry for him and his daughter. And then about two hours afterwards, but he was a, a, yeah, a sexual a rapist or whatever, or whatever yeah, the thing them. was. And I've, I've never been an avid sports fan. I've always got just kind of a passing knowledge of it, but I asked the question, was he ever convicted of that? And it started this firestorm back and forth of, no, but he was credibly accused. And I was like, okay, well, I don't know what that, what does credibly accused mean as, as opposed to incredibly accused? I guess I can understand that. And at some point along the way, uh, there was a phrase, and I don't know if they said believe all women or believe women. And you know me, I'm as liberal, progressive, tree huggery as they come. I'm yep. all for everything. But I was like, I don't know that I can wrap my head around that because I take everybody as a tabula rasa until they start telling me things. Right. So I'm going to believe anybody, but I'm also going to be skeptical and I'm going to take in the information on a case by case. But one of the big problems with prosecution of these cases is very often it's just based on an accusation. Yeah. I mean, my daughter's in law school right now. Sure. And she oh, I didn't know that. She, oh, yeah. She just finished her you first year. You didn't you didn't and, uh, you didn't know that. away from it. Uh, no, because let her clerk with me. I'll, I'll get her into there something else. Yeah. Uh, but but, you know, she's not sure that she wants to practice law. She says, because all it is, is is two sides trying to get their way and manipulate the, the information to get what they want. Sure. It's no longer about kind of settling things out. It's 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 absolutely focused on winning or losing now. Right. Um, so. I don't even know where we, where do we go? No, I was just talking about oh, Kobe the, Bryant. Yeah. Uh, yeah. People, uh, Americans tend to be very prudish on the outside, but in the bedroom, they tend to be perverts. Yeah. Okay. So our, our, you know, we have to act very proper on the outside in society. And so we get the naysayers who, who jump to the first negative thing they can about somebody. Um, and if I remember correctly, that, ca that case was settled. Uh, yeah, I think was it was no settled. There was a anything. gag order, a non-disclosure agreement or whatever. Yep. Uh, so two other things that I definitely want to touch on before I let you go. Uh, well, I'm going to go out of order uh, is suicide. Yes. And suicide specifically with, quote unquote, bullying as the culprit. There seems to be a prevalence of that or at least a, a reported prevalence of that today. Is that something that you've seen an uptick or is that, again, similar to the... I, I think there's a big uptick in bullying or at least our attention paid to it. Uh, bullying now can be so much worse than it used to be when we were kids. With social media. Social media and the internet, it just can be vicious. And yeah, so I think I think there is an uptick in suicides as a result of, of bullying. Okay. Okay. Uh, then the thing that kind of triggered me was the non-disclosure agreement. I don't know how much or how little you want to talk of politics today. but no, I'll, I'll talk. Okay. Uh, have you done any analysis of, uh, you know, the current president or the potential next president? <laughs> um, sure. As much as can where, be done where, on Where are we tube. going with this? <laughs> well, uh, you know, I, 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 there was I, an, I, don't, I don't talk politics and I don't talk religion, but I'm, I'm well, happy to venture in there to a certain extent. Well, so there was an interview that, that uh, got released in the past week. Uh, Trump did it on uh, HBO. It was about a 30 minute interview where yep. they talked to him about uh, it's potentially dangerous how he's putting a positive spin on COVID versus the reality of it. You know, Correct. he keeps wanting to say the cases are going down. Uh, you know, the deaths he's, are going down. He's lying to the public. Yeah. And that's, that's, you know, that in my opinion, I have to respect our president. Sure. And so when there are these, you know, sometimes presidents say things that they're mistaken about. Sure. But when you're saying things that are absolutely deliberately falsehoods and you know it. I have a real problem with that. And consistently doing so. Consistently. He's done it since he's been in office. I mean, 
the so this this is kind of in that same lane is there almost seems to be a an intent a, a, an intensified opportunity to question reality um you know and and for those of us who are firmly grounded in it we're okay but s- some people aren't so much so and now it just seems like facts you know s- objective reality is gone like yeah. like i can literally argue with you that you're not with me right now and it could go either way right. there's something known as cognitive dissonance okay okay and that's when your brain has two different pieces of information that conflict with each other you have to get rid of one of them sure so if 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 you are a, a long time uh, president supporter okay and you love him and you love what he's done and then you get information that's contrary to what you believe, you either have to not like him or you have to disregard the information that's coming in. And and so more people tend to disregard information coming in that's contrary to the way they want to feel. And that happens for both him and party. It happens and with everybody. Sh- sure. Team, yep. you know, uh, but so, you know, you always hear about his base and it seems like the cognitive dissidents is strongest with the base. And then, you know, you go over the left and you have the that side of it, too. And then you have those middle moderate people who can kind of go where the day takes them, which, you know, I'm interested to see what what that means in November. Yeah. I mean, it's it's it'll be a real interesting November. It sure will be. Yeah. <laughs> um, Did you spend any time uh, studying or reading on Jeffrey Epstein? A little bit, not a lot. I mean, I, I know the case. So what's interesting to me about that case is is the fact that there seems to be a a helper with this Jazane Maxwell lady. Yes. It seems to me like one person having that that degree of whatever you want to call it, sure that exists, but to have two people working in tandem in that way is kind of peculiar. It's 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 unusual. Sure. I mean, he he needed somebody. He needed a woman a to be able to, yep, to get what he wanted. She, I mean, you know, she was young. And they were both young. It was, I'm sure, it was very exciting. Right. Um. It's it's unusual to get that combination sometimes, and then other times it's not at all unusual for you know if you look at the Canadian case of Carla Homolka, mm-hmm. she and her husband. Um. You know, there was the two of them, and the wife used to bring in uh, little girls, but she was just as much a part of the case. As as he was. Right. I mean, that's a horrid case. I think you've talked to me about that case. And I know through my my, you know, watching various serial killer documentaries that sometimes there's kind of a that sort of setup as well. Yeah, you can get uh, it's I, I don't speak French, but it's a, a folly de lou or something to that effect where two people are under the same delusion. Sure. OK. And and really, with what happened there, I, I think that's capable of the Epstein case. Now, there's all this talk of this kind of underbelly of Hollywood or of politicians Politics or, and everything else yep. of of, you know, there's these big names out there. How much stock do you put into that? I put stock enough that I that I don't believe that Jeffrey Epstein killed, killed himself. himself. Sure. Now, yeah. now he may have been forced to kill himself. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. But you could resign, or you can. Yeah, be you, fired. Can, you can do it, or you know, uh, and we'll take care of the people. If you do sure. it, if you do it on your own, we'll take care of people. Sure. But I certainly wouldn't want to be her and be stuck in jail. Uh, I'd be I, very concerned about my. Own I safety. feel like the sooner she loses herself of that information, the less important and less of a target she becomes. I mean, well, or or more of a target because she'll have to testify. Um, but I mean, couldn't they just go in and do a sworn statement of her and just get it all on the record right you, now? Well, you can get it on record, but but again, Cecilia. everybody everybody gets a chance to face their accuser. Sure. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I wouldn't. I I I think her her personal safety is. I think her best bet is just to play dumb. Yeah. And and not say anything. Yeah. So uh, you uh, told me before uh, we got on the show today that you've somewhat transitioned to the whole nursing home world right now. Yeah, I've, I, it's constant work. I'm glad I was doing it. Again, I still do my custody work and my consults and all that. But uh, I, I've, I've always followed God's um, thumbprint calling on my life. And I got this calling about four years ago to start doing some nursing home work. And I do it a lot regularly now. Um it's good work. It's easy work. Um, love the old people. You know, I, I talk to people that are over 100 years old every day. Thank you for saying that because, uh, you know, uh, lost my, my dad in 2018, lost my mom in 2019. And, you know, there's so many there's there's so many forgotten groups in society. We've got our military veterans. We've got our homeless and we've got our elderly. And they just always have a blind eye turned to them. Yes. And 
I, I, I hope probably not in my lifetime, but those three areas, there's some sort of sea change in treating those people. I was listening to, who was it? I think it was John Stewart on Joe Rogan was talking about work that he's done with vets about how much passion and fire we put towards people when they're in the military. Right. And as soon as they get out, we forget them. Yep. Who gives a shit? Yep. No, every, every time I cross it, come across a veteran and I know he is, I thank him for his service. Yeah. Uh, and, or females too. Yeah. Um, and so I, I, it's so weird to me that dynamic, you know, and then the homeless, the fact of the homeless and, and how much it's, it's based on both mental health and substance abuse. It, it blows my mind that in this day and age, we have homeless people, but it's, Persistent. And right. Well, this goes back. This goes back to the '60s, and when they when they emptied out the um, the institutions. Sure. Okay. Now the people that used to be in institutions are are a third of them are in jail, and a third of them are in homeless, and a third of them are getting mediocre treatment. Right. Uh, and and they're still on the streets, but they come in and out of jail, and they're not very functional. We we did a disservice to all of those groups. Yeah. When we emptied out the institutions. And then lastly is the elderly. Uh, and it, it's such a crushing experience. I mean, those of, those of us who are lucky enough to go in the blink of an eye and don't have to endure what it means to stay in an ALF or an ILF. I mean, it's the most depressing thing in many ways, you know, and. Yeah, I mean, you're, it, you know, the nursing homes, you're stuck in a little tiny 10 by 10 room. Sure. With a roommate. You know, you moved in there from a, you know, a 2000 square foot home. You don't have any of your personal belongings. You don't have any privacy. Uh, you have to share a bathroom with somebody else. You're eating what they give you. Which You're is eating never- what they give you. And let me tell you, the food in those places is, oh, awful. is, is pretty bad. Substandard. Yeah. Pretty bad. Um, you know, they get good medical care. And right now they are in the very safest places they can be. Yeah. You, you I mean, you couldn't get into a nursing home if you wanted to. Sure. Okay. I, I get in because I get tested every Monday, but only essential personnel. They're not even allowed to see family members. The best they can do is go to a window and talk to each other through the phone. That's that's the blessing that I, you know, if people, you know, ask me how I'm doing and I just thank God or whomever that both my parents passed before this. Because yes. if they were going through now what they went through two years and one year ago and I didn't get to be, I was lucky enough to be able to hold my father when he passed and I was lucky enough to be able to hold my mother when she passed. And that, that in many ways gave me the closure that I needed to move on. And if I. So they died in a nursing home and, and I got touched a call them in three and it happened and they were alone. Yep. I just don't know that I could ever. Yeah. I, I feel real bad for the families that, 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 that has happened to. I really do. Crazy. So anyway, well, I really appreciate you coming by today. Absolutely. It's this been has a been pleasure. Great. I haven't seen you in a long time and uh, I'm glad to hear that you're doing well. And uh, I, I wish you all the best. Absolutely. And I love your podcast. All right. Thank you, sir. Have a great day. 